Good morning, everyone. We are going to wait two minutes to let a few more fo folks join in. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. We are gonna wait just one more minute. I see the numbers are increasing. We're just letting a few more folks join this town hall. All right. Good morning, everyone. It is 902. I see the numbers are still slowly growing. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Daisy Gonzalez and I'm the Deputy Chancellor of the California Community Colleges Chancellor's Office. Thank you for joining us for the California Community Colleges Virtual Town Hall. As the MC, I will start off by walking you through some of the logistics of this meeting. I wanna first remind you all that you do have access to closed captioning during this webinar. You will need to click on the closed caption icon and turn on the closed captioning feature. I also wanna remind you all that today's video uh, town hall is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Vision Resource Center for future reference. We will also use our Q&A box and you can open it at any point in time to ask a question but we will be using that box to engage you throughout this town hall. Panelists, as a final reminder, please remember to mute yourselves while you are not speaking. So today is a really special day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I have the honor of kicking off this town hall, and I wanna share with you that today is really special for three key reasons. Number one, a month ago, uh, when our world turned upside down, and uh, we started thinking about budget advocacy for 2020 and 2021, we decided to turn our advocacy day into a virtual town hall. But a month ago, we could have never imagined how much interest there was from our community to join a virtual town hall. So today is special, not only because it's our first virtual advocacy day, but because there were over 2,100 registered participants who were interested in joining us today. The second reason why today is so special is because we have an incredible lineup of speakers and state legislators who are joining us today to support California's community colleges and share with us how California's community college leaders can partner with them. And then lastly, today is special because our goal for this town hall is clear. We are dedicating an entire day to uplift the voices of California's community colleges and to remind our state leaders that California's community colleges stand ready to help California recover from this emergency. So if you are active on social media, we're going to ask you to stay engaged throughout the day. This town hall is only a part of our entire day of advocacy. So please, if you're active on social media, now is the time to snap a photo of this slide. And we're gonna ask you to use these hashtags and Twitter handles. And during this town hall, we're also going to ask you to stay engaged. Like many of you, California's community colleges gave me an opportunity to get an education. I grew up in foster care and moved a lot. 
but I am here in front of you because California's community colleges gave me an education and gave me a voice. Three specific community colleges, in fact, LA Valley College, Mission College, and West LA. But my story is not unique. California's community colleges are special to all of us. So today we wanna to hear your story. At any point in time, please share your story on social media, on the Q&A box. We're also gonna ask you to share that story with your local legislators and encourage them to support California's community colleges during this state budget session. So let's test out your engagement throughout this town hall. I'm gonna ask you to use the Q&A box and I'm gonna do a roll call. And here's a very simple question. I want you to just type in one thing. What California Community College are you representing today? So let's see. Saddleback College, Mount San Jacinto College, Grossmont College, Los Rio CCD, another Saddleback College, LA Valley College, West Hills, a lot of West Hills, Cuyamaca, Miracosta, San Diego, Lake Tahoe with exclamation marks. All right, you guys got the hang of it. It's amazing to see so many of you out there. I'm gonna keep reading those, but I really wanna get to the next part of our presentation. So thank you. Wow, over 631 Q&A responses. California Community Colleges are all here. So now let's walk through the agenda because we have a lot of special guests. The kickoff. That just happened. Uh, we will first start off with opening remarks by the president of the Board of Governors, Tom Epstein. After our board president speaks, our chancellor, Chancellor Ilio Ortiz Oakley, will provide opening remarks. After his remarks, our vice chancellor of CFFP, Lizette Navarrete, will cover our uh, shared budget priorities very briefly. And then we have very special guests from the legislature. There will be remarks from Assemblymember Phil Ting, Assemblymember Kevin McCarty, Assemblymember Jose Medina. After our distinguished guests speak, we will have a student leaders panel that will be moderated by our Vice Chancellor of Government Relations, David O'Brien, featuring three students, very special students, Alexis Zaragoza, who is a Board of Governors, student board member, Danny Tiracu, who's the president of the SSCCC for our system, and Samantha Gonzalez Pulido, who is a student from Bakersfield College. After the student panel, we will move on to four special guests, our partners in advocacy. I wanna remind everyone that we had a budget advocacy letter and it was signed by over 72 system partners districts, business partners, our uh, advocacy and equity partners. And so today we are featuring four of them during this town hall. And then we will end our town hall with a, a Q&A using the chat box with all of you. So with that, I wanna get us started. I wanna thank you for joining us. I wanna acknowledge that we have over 1700 participants right now and 760 Q&A responses around all the colleges that are here joining us. So. Let's get started. Without further delay, I want to introduce to you the president of the Board of Governors, Tom Epstein. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Epstein, president of the Board of Governors, and I want to wish you and your family and friends uh, safety and good health in this uh, trying time. I first want to thank Chancellor Oakley and his team for their hard work to make today possible, as well as for their tireless efforts to help college, the colleges, as our governor likes to say, meet the moment. On this special day, which is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, um, I had a, uh, a special moment too. I actually woke up early, uh, showered, shaved, and put on a collared shirt for the first time in a while. But on behalf of the Board of Governors, we appreciate your joining us to make the community college's budget a state priority. We greatly appreciate the entire community of faculty, staff, students, unions, and other constituencies that are joining hands in common cause. I assure you that the board is committed to doing everything we can to help our colleges, students, and system, system partners succeed during this crisis. And in fact, we uh, authorized and approved emergency actions by the chancellor to help uh, facilitate that. And we welcome your input if you think there are other things that the board can do to be helpful. Um, obviously, we all know why we need state budget support. Uh, the community colleges are vital to the state's efforts to fight the COVID epidemic 
as well as to recover from the economic recession caused by the pandemic. We train a large share of first responders and healthcare workers. And historically, when people lose their jobs, they come to improve their skills, increasing their engagement and, in, and enrollment. We must efficiently be funded to support the reemployment needs of these millions of Californians displaced by the crisis. And in addition, colleges incurred significant costs in the abrupt transition to online education, as well as the emergency measures to help students. Student, many students lost access to some of their courses if they didn't have online uh, easily accessible. They also lost income and even food. That's why our letter requests resources to support students and colleges through the health crisis while mitigating disruption to instruction and affirming our focus on equity. And finally, I do want to talk a second about online education. With more than two, two million diverse students, our colleges face many challenges using these new technologies to serve the state's most vulnerable populations. And I want to offer my congratulations to the colleges and faculty for their quick transition to online education. And as we adapt to this new reality, it presents an opportunity for the system to become a leader in online higher ed. We shouldn't think of online as a one-time emergency to be abandoned when normalcy returns. In-person instruction is superior, but it can't be our only option. To fulfill our mission and grow enrollment over the long term, we must offer Californians a convenient, high quality and low cost online public alternative to the for-profit and out-of-state competitors. And finally, we should advocate for universal broadband access so all of our students can easily access online instruction. So to conclude, I wanna thank you for your commitment and please stay engaged. We know that the competition for state dollars will be fierce, and we urge you all to contact legislators via email, phone calls, and social media to make our case. Thanks to your participation today. Thank you, President Epstein. All right, and now uh, I would like to introduce to all of you Chancellor Ilio Ortiz Oakley, who will provide some remarks. All right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, President Epstein, for those words. Um, uh, I just want to begin with <clears throat> a whole lot of gratitude. Gratitude to everybody who's on this uh, town hall this morning. Gratitude to all of our faculty, amazing staff, uh, administrators, supervisors, everyone who's making um, this new normal a reality for our students and helping them get through this crisis. Um, uh, so as you can see, I'm, I am joined here by our fearless leader in Washington, D.C., Dr. Fauci. Uh, but there are so many leaders um, in our system today. And of course, I uh, have to thank the governor, the legislative leadership, uh, everyone uh, in California who's been helping us get through this crisis, um, and in particular, the Board of Governors for continuing to support our efforts at uh, helping our colleges get through this. So. Um, you know, this is clearly um, uh, an unprecedented time for all of us, and I know many of us will look back at this moment in time, uh, remember how it was before COVID-19, and really think about all the things that happened, all the opportunities that presented themselves during and after this crisis. Uh, we will see a new world, a new normal, a new way of supporting our state, our communities, and our students after this crisis. Uh, so I want to thank you all for coming together. And of course, it's so amazing to see um, the fruits of the work that we do every single day on the news. When you see those nurses, when you see those first responders, when you see those EMTs, police, fire, all of the individuals, all of the heroes that are saving lives every single day, Many of them came through our colleges. Many of them were educated at our colleges. So the California Community Colleges have been key, have been critical to our uh, response to COVID-19. And now we need to turn our attention to what the recovery uh, looks like and ensure that the California Community Colleges are front and center. Um, so uh, we recognize that the state budget <laughs> fiscal situation is, is a challenge right now. Um, and as you can tell, my dogs feel the same way. But, um, uh, and there'll be many demands on the state budget. Uh, but we will work hard to ensure that our members understand 
our leaders understand the importance of the California Community Colleges. So um, thank you, thank you for switching to the side. So what have we done to respond? And I know many of you have been on the front lines taking care of this, uh, but basically we have stepped up in so many ways. We, when the state needed ventilators, our colleges stepped up, donated well over 140 ventilators. Uh, we've donated um, many, many, many tons of personal protective equipment to our state. We've been creating personal protective equipment through our 3D printing capacity. Uh, our colleges immediately jump in and took action to transition to online instruction, remote learning, take care of our students. So many of our colleges have stepped forward to take care of our students. They put into motion the vision for success in this crisis. And of course, we've continued critical training for our healthcare professionals, our frontline um, responders, uh, and we've prioritized um, guidance and executive orders to support you all, to support our colleges to make sure this work gets done. Next slide, please. But of course, that's the response. Now comes the recovery. Um, and we are right in the middle of this recovery. We are helping to support our communities. This year alone, the California Community Colleges provided training for over 20,000 first responders and essential healthcare professionals. Um, that's key. We need to continue to ensure that we are preparing the workforce, not only for the current response, but for the future response. Because as we know, this is not gonna be a one episode, a one-time situation we're gonna to need to continue to provide support to ensure that we have a workforce, an essential workforce to help us through the recovery. And of course, I don't have to remind you all, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but seven in 10 of the California nurses receive their training and education in the California community colleges. So again, I wanna thank all of you who are working every day to prepare our first responders. You know, historical trends indicate that California will turn to community colleges again in this coming recession. And we know it's coming. The demands in the state budget, the demands on the country, the demands on the globe are amazing. And so that will um, cause us to once again have to dig deep and support our displaced workers, support communities throughout California that are desperate to get back into the workforce as quickly as possible. And they're gonna to turn to us once again. So, um, as you talk to your members of the legislature, as you talk to leaders throughout your community, remind them of this important element. What we learned from the last recession was that we began to cut resources at the moment in time when so many students needed us um, and needed our support. Um, I recognize that there's gonna be a lot of challenges going forward, but we need to continue to press this case. Our students and their basic needs are critical. We knew that there was a crisis going into this COVID-19 situation. Our students were some of the most vulnerable members of their community before this crisis. This crisis has just exacerbated the current situation. It has not lessened the needs of our students. It's increased the challenges that our students face. Their basic needs are critical. We need to continue to advocate for their basic needs and support and relief for our students. And of course, as we heard, and sadly, no surprise that undocumented students are left out of the CARES Act. And I know this uh, makes you as angry as it makes me, but you know what? This is another call to action for us as a system, for us as a state to reach out and take care of the members of our community, regardless of what document come with. They're heroes. They're the grocery workers. They're the farm workers. They're the ones providing and supporting the food chain right now. They're police, fire, nurses, they're everywhere, and they're heroes, and they deserve more than what the federal government has given them. Um, our students need support going forward. Our faculty, our staff need support going forward. We're gonna need support to continue to transition to this remote environment. Uh, whether it's summer, fall, going forward, we're gonna need to continue to be more resilient, and we're gonna need investment from the state to make sure that we're there for our students. So I, I wanna just say thank you. Uh, thank you to, to our partners, everyone who's collaborating with us today and going forward. Um, uh, you know, we have a, a, a joint advocacy letter 
that's signed by so many groups that it would take me an hour to go through all the lists of our partners, but they're all here. I wanna thank all of our labor organizations, our academic senate, uh, all of the faculty, staff, uh, all of our advocacy partners, some of which are in this town hall today. Thank you so much. Uh, we hope that you come out for this advocacy day uh, more enthusiastic and more hopeful about the future of California than ever before. This is a moment in time that's shining a spotlight on the California Community Colleges. Uh, so let's continue to spread that message. Let's continue to ensure that our students are front and center in decision making and resource allocation uh, and working together. I know we can do that. So again, thank you. And with that, I want to turn it back over to Deputy Chancellor Daisy Gonzalez. Thank you, Chancellor Oakley. I want to hand it over to Vice Chancellor Lizette Navarrete, who will briefly cover our shared budget advocacy. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us for our first ever virtual advocacy day. Uh, special thanks to all of our key partners that have joined us um, in this time um, and our legislative leaders that um, demonstrate their continued support for our colleges by being here. So thank you very much. I just briefly want to share some of uh, our shared advocacy um, in our next slide. Um, we sh I'll share some of our ongoing requests. As Chancellor Oakley has stated, uh, we are currently in the response, but we need state support in the recovery, and that can only be done by continuity of resources. So we ask our legislative leaders to ensure that we uh, get an, an appropriate share of the, uh, the Prop 98 Stabilization Fund and the Rainy Day Fund. Uh, Californians will turn to us when the economy uh, it, it declines, and especially for workforce training um, and upskilling. We also need resources uh, to support our students uh, in an equitable fashion during this tough time. And, and that can be done through an online education ecosystem and an infrastructure of services such as uh, Canvas support, um, ensuring that we have online tutoring for our students, online proctoring, uh, proctoring platforms. And most importantly, that we don't um, ab abandon our students when they need us most or, um, in student services through counseling, mental health services, um, and ensuring that everything that we move online can be ADA compliant. So we also can't forget our faculty uh, and our part-time faculty who will also uh, need our support um, and that we're leaning on um, during this tough times as well. So uh, we, we've asked for support for um, our faculty groups as well. Um, and then next I wanna share that we are making some one-time requests um, and this uh, aligns with what we know our students need. Um, as uh, Chancellor Oakley stated, and as well as President uh, Epstein stated, uh, the basic needs, challenges that our students have faced um, have not gone away during this crisis. They've only increased. Uh, so we are asking for a block grant that addresses basic needs, that includes emergency supports for our students, and that helps our colleges transition uh, and recover from this crisis. We ask for uh, continued investment in uh, a diversity uh, fellowship pilot program. And then most importantly, we're asking for an, a backfill of any enrollment fees that we've had to uh, reimburse for students uh, that uh, needed our support and could not continue their education or pause their education during this time. Um, that will be critical in ensuring that uh, we maintain uh, the resources for our colleges and a quality level of service. And then lastly, uh, in the next slide, we can't, lose momentum on Cal Grant reform. Uh, and that uh, is something that we will continue to work with our financial aid partners and our students to make the case. We are also um, ensuring that we keep capital outlay programs and projects moving. These projects keep Californians working uh, and it's essential that we protect them. But so now uh, we invite you to continue to be engaged online. Um, our hashtags and handle are listed at the bottom of the slide. So we hope that you'll join us in advocacy. And again, thank you to our partners. I now wanna turn it over to our uh, legislative leaders 
Um, and I want to uh, have I have the honor of introducing Assembly Member Phil Ting, Assembly Member Phil Ting of District 19. He uh, in, Sac in San Francisco is the chair of the Assembly Budget Committee. Uh, we have the honor of him joining us today. Um, and I want to thank him. Um, so I invite him to say a few remarks. Thank you again. Assembly Member Phil Ting. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Very much appreciate the welcome and welcome to all the uh, community college family up and down the state. It's really an honor to be here this morning. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I'm so proud of everything that all of you have been doing to uh, readjust to life under this pandemic. I know that uh, all of us started the year with uh, different priorities, different hopes, and uh, we've all had to change in midstream. So I just want to thank you for all of that. I know that um, while you're just working to manage your daily life, uh, make sure your families are okay, make sure you're okay. I know you're also making sure that your students are learning. You've now had to adjust to teaching students virtually and not having the face-to-face -face contact, which all of us feel is so critical in a learning environment. In Sacramento, it's, it's the same thing. We're, we're adjusting as well. Uh, I've been sheltering in place for the last five weeks. I was in Sacramento on Monday for the first time in uh, five weeks. And so for us, it's also an adjustment to do our jobs, uh, be able to connect with the public, connect with constituents, but also making sure that we are available for all the various stakeholders like yourselves that are very active in the budget process. I uh, was excited to hear about all the work that's happening out of Washington, D.C., and that the community colleges were beneficiaries of $578 million through the Federal CARES Act. Uh, our higher education institutions were able to get a certain amount of funding from the federal stimulus package. We'll continue to advocate for more money as Washington debates what else to fund coming out of the stimulus package. As you all know, uh, for those of us who lived through the last recession, recessions are when we need government the most, yet it's a time where government has to be shrinking just because our tax dollars are shrinking. And we see this situation no different than we did 10 years ago. What we face is a very different type of challenge where we are at home. And not only may we have to deal with uh, shrinking dollars, but now we have to adjust to a completely different way of life in the interim. Uh, I know that our assembly has had to work on how do we do remote meetings? How do we uh, allow remote participation? And I know that in the community colleges, you're in the same boat. Well, we are very much uh, with you hand in hand. We know that you are one of the most important institutions in the state. Frankly, I think you're the backbone of the economy. I, while UC may be uh, leaders in the innovation economy, you are really the backbone, the foundation of our higher education system. For so many people who are looking to start a different life, whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, or 60, most often they turn to the community colleges first. They go to class in the community colleges first. And they discover oftentimes their passions in the community colleges first. So we know that that's a major priority. So having said that, let me just give you what is sobering budget news. We understand that the administration's May revise is going to be what they call a baseline budget. And the easiest way to explain that is it would probably be a continuing budget from this year with very little augmentations or changes outside of perhaps money for uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, for homelessness and maybe wildfires. That's, that's what we're anticipating. Many of the governor's priorities that he unveiled in January that I was personally excited about may not be in the June 15th budget that we passed. In fact, we're not gonna get a clear picture of our revenues until the end of July because we moved the tax deadline to help everybody from April 15th to July 15th. So we're not gonna get a clear picture till August. And unfortunately, even when we get that clearer picture, we may be doing cuts, not additions to the budget. 
And so for us, I ask you what we've been asking every Californian is to help us out to come together and figure out what we can do best and what we can do also in this very trying times. I know it's very tough. I know that faculty are hurting. I know students are hurting. We already had many students who are yeah, homeless. I'm not living on edge before this pandemic hit. That hasn't changed, so we're very acutely aware of that. So our major focus right now in terms of the budget will be doing everything we can to, conf to confront this pandemic. And then next, to really focus on economic recovery. And part of that really has to do with ensuring what type of support we can give to everybody who's feeling on the edge. And, and the one thing, while I know that uh, we will be giving support, the one thing I could tell you is I don't think it'll be as much as any of us would like. I'm, I'm from San Francisco. Uh, there are proposals that we're always looking to push the envelope, to shoot for the stars, and the way I approach the budget is no different. However, we do have to pass a balanced budget. We can't go into debt like the federal government, so we must ensure that we pass that constitutionally balanced budget. One thing you can do to assist us is there, there may be revenue proposals on the ballot in November. Talk to people about why they should support a revenue measure, why the state needs revenue. Uh, there may be revenue proposals next year. Talk about why it's so critical to get increased revenue to the state because most people think it, go, it goes to fund me and people in suits, where in actuality, it really goes to fund all of you teaching in the classrooms. It goes to fund our nurses in the hospitals. It goes to fund our law enforcement officials. And it really goes to help so many hardworking Californians up and down the state. So with that, let me just thank you for all your hard work. Thank you for staying at home and adjusting to this very tough time. And I also just wanna thank you for all your hard work in teaching and training so many millions of Californians. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Felting. Again, thank you for your partnership. Um, and we look forward to connecting with you uh, and working with you to uplift California. And thank you for your recognition that California community colleges are the backbone of this economy and train uh, the most workers. So we look forward to partnering with you in the next months. I next want to take time to uh, introduce uh, another key legislative partner uh, that works closely on the California Community College's budget, uh, Assemblymember Kevin McCarty of District 7 in Sacramento. Uh, is the chair of the subcommittee two, which focuses on education finance and deals with the California Community Colleges budget. He is a partner and friend of the California Community Colleges. So welcome, we, look, we are glad that you can join us. Um, we look forward to hearing your remarks. Uh, Assembly member Kevin McCarty, thank you. Thank you, uh, let me unmute here. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, waiting for me. I'm like, a lot of Californians trying to juggle Zoom calls and getting the kids breakfast and getting going with their homework, so, or their schoolwork, so it's the reality. Um, but uh, yeah, our, our budget chairman, Ting, uh, laid out what, what the reality check is for us here. And, and frankly, we don't know. This is uncharted territory. There are no answers to this. We don't really know how it's going to, to play out. We don't know how it's going to play out as far as um, the financial situation. We don't know as far as it's going to play out as far as get, getting back to normal. Um, but the, the community college uh, uh, segment and system, as, uh, as, as was noted just now, is, of course, the workhorse of higher education in California. Um, again, I'm, I'm a proud community college um, alum here in Sacramento, went to American River College. And so I, I, I know firsthand what it means, um, students going to um, you know, get workforce training to get it to get, you know, their career going, get, get in the transfer path, you know, uh, basic skills, the whole, the whole lot. So, um, and what we're doing right now with, ironically, a year or so ago, we had this big debate about higher education and college and online, and now we're doing it online. Um, and so I, I'm not, not sure this is the path how we're going to get here, but it's the reality check. And uh, as uh, was noted, I'm, I'm super proud 
of the, the faculty and the 100 plus campuses across the state that are doing it right now to figure out that the show goes on and how we have students continue with their higher education goals, whether or not they want to transfer or, or you know, make sure that they continue on the path. And that is critically important. And we, the reality is that there are skill sets that are vastly different. You know, students that are at Santa Monica City College that are on the path to transfer to UCLA, you know, are maybe different than the community college student, you know, with limited um, uh, skills, maybe uh, language skills who don't necessarily have the tech, on, tech, tech wherewithal who are trying to figure it out. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. We know that with, with 2 million people. And so I want to thank um, all the uh, faculty members and, and support staff from, from all across our campuses are doing that. And I, I've heard so, uh, from a few here in Sacramento how it's going. And, you know, people are working really hard. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, as far as the, um, what, what's next in the budget, um, you know, Mr. Ting just laid it out there. Uh, it's, it's going to be very, very dicey, just to be honest, as far as well, what's next. The, the, the best news that we can hope for is this is, this is a limited uh, term recession. Unlike the, the Great Recession um, 10 years ago or prior ones, our hope is that this, of course, is because this uh, global health pandemic and not an underlying uh, economic uh, uh, e economic issues that we have in our in our overall um, California and worldwide economy that we can get back to, but we don't know. So there will be some some pain in the short term. So you know, one thing that um, that I want to we should ask our our um, community college system, whether it's the um, you know the chancellor's office or the community college league or others who are talking to us about the budget, of course, you have your job to do. I understand. You have your job. I, I saw um, Vice Chancellor Navarrete's presentation about the COLA and financial aid and all those other pieces. You want to lay it out there. What you think you need is more. And our job is looking at the, the you know, simple mathematics and figuring out what the reality is potentially um, having less to go around. So, you know, one thing that we need to figure out is what can we do to hopefully bridge this? Um, of course, one, some, one thing you do in a bridge when there's a recession is use one-time money. Um, granted, we're burning through a lot of our one-time money right now just dealing with this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, we had a hearing a couple of days ago, and we've spent almost $7 billion of our roughly uh, 20, million, 20 billion in one-time funds. Granted, we're trying to see if we can get reimbursed from the federal government through that. So, you know, of course, we'll look at bridging this gap um, up with one-time revenues, but what can we do as far as the, the system is flexibility? I know that there's not a ton of resources already in our community college budget, and you articulate that every year, that you serve, you know, two, billion, two million students and have roughly the same allocation per student for the UC system, and obviously many more students there, of course, in, in your system. So what type of flexibility can we have? You know, what, what, what can we do? Um, differently on a short-term basis that it's not maybe optimum, but things things that we can do to think that how can we get through one or two years because we're not going to be able to fill um, the, the monetary gap that, that's going to be out there. It's going to be very, very, um, very, very painful. And so I think that's just the reality. The two things I want to sh share with you today is what type of flexibility and how we can work on this bridge, hoping that it's really a one-year, maximum two-year um, painful situation. Um, and uh, with that, I also wanted to note that um, the issues we talked about with financial aid earlier, uh, that continues. Um, I think, you know, we're well aware of what the reality check is for students, especially community college students, some of the lowest income students in our college system now, dealing with the non-tuition costs of, of uh, rent and food and transportation you know, all that exact, exasperated now when they're not working. And so we're very, very mindful of that. Um, we want to make sure that we keep students in the, um, in, in the system. You know, there's some examples of some um, crisis across the, the, the nation. For example, after Katrina, a lot of stu students, community college students dropped out, never went back. And we know we need here in California, not just for your community colleges, not to have a dip in enrollment, um, and the flip side, we need to, to continue to grow to, 
to, to address the workforce needs of today and tomorrow with more college graduates. So um, we're mindful of that. And the, the Cal grant reform, we, while we don't have um, money on the table right now in the general fund, it still continues. Assembly member Medina, who I see right here, shaking his head. We're working on that. We actually have a, a potential a financial source for a, for a future ballot measure we're exploring too. So that issue is not going away. Um, but in some, I look forward to the rest of the, the conversation. I'm not sure if we're going to do questions and answers here, but I know we have uh, other speakers. So let me stop. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member McCarty. We appreciate your um, your honesty in the in the challenges we face, but we also appreciate your recognition that um, community colleges will play an essential role in their recovery uh, and that we need to be available and resource so that we are ready to serve Californians. So thank you for, for your words. We look forward to partnering with you in the coming months. I now want to invite um, a good friend um, and uh, partner of the California Community Colleges, Assemblymember Jose Medina, uh, former community college trustee, uh, and a longtime champion of our colleges. He's the assembly member of uh, District 61 in Riverside and the chair of the Assembly Higher Education Committee. Welcome, Assembly Member Medina. Thank you, Lizette. Uh, also, want to thank uh, Chancellor Oakley, all the students, uh, faculty, administrators who are on. And I, I think that uh, both my colleagues, Assembly Member Phil Ting, and Assembly Member McCarty uh, have done a good job of painting the very uncertain future uh, for the budget for the state of California. And uh, I think that we uh, in the legislature uh, all understand that and know that the times ahead are, are gonna be tough uh, as they are tough for everyone, as they are tough for students. But with, given that reality, I, I just want to share that I believe uh, that it is even more important now for students to do what they are doing here today, uh, to continue to communicate with their state legislators so that we know very well what the obstacles are. Uh, I think when Assembly Member McCarty and I, uh, working with, uh, um, with uh, Senator Leva, uh, proposed the Cal Grant reform. It was because we had heard from students, because we had heard from students up and down the state, you know, the need, the need for uh, resources to cover housing, uh, food, transportation. And, uh, and I was happy to hear uh, Assembly Member McCarty uh, saying that, that, you know, that we will try and will continue forward with Cal Grant reform. So I, I think that demonstrates again, why the stories of students, uh, what the special circumstances are, how students are adapting to the new situation, how students are adapting to online learning, to what the obstacles are, to what the challenges are, uh, both to students and to faculty, to the community college uh, system as a whole. Uh, those stories need to be shared. They need to be shared with, uh, with the state legislators. A uh, particular um, of students who, who may be first generation, uh, who have challenges at home, uh, economic situation at home, all those kind of things uh, need to be shared. I, I, I think the example of need was demonstrated when the uh, College Future Foundation put out, I think it was around $2 million in aid to students uh, college students throughout the state of California. And within two hours, uh, I believe all that $2 million worth of money uh, was, uh, was gone. So again, thank you to the students who are here today. Please continue to do the good work that you're doing and make sure that your voices are heard. Thank you all. Thank you, Assemblymember Medina. Um, really appreciate your words uh, and your encouragement of our students um, and encouragement for them to share their stories. We look forward to partnering with you in these coming months. 
Thank you, Vice Chancellor Neverett, and, th and thank you to Assemblymember Ting, Assemblymember McCarty, Assemblymember Medina. We're heading into a really important part of our town hall. I just want to acknowledge a few comments that I'm seeing in our chat box. One, if you're experiencing connection issues, it seems to be that several of you are able to log off and rejoin and you experience a, a better connectivity. So try that. I'm seeing a lot of folks uh, who have had a lot of success by logging off and logging back in. Second, love all of the success stories. I want to give a shout out to the president of Porterville for sharing her success story and how she used community colleges and is now a president of one of our California community colleges. And lastly, saw a lot of comments around, can you please repost the hashtags as Vice Chancellor Navarrete mentioned, they are at the bottom of every slide. But our students from uh, City College of San Francisco, SMAC, actually took a picture of the slide. So if you follow them on Twitter, they actually have a tweet with that specific slide. So if you're looking for more of the Twitter handles and the hashtags, follow them. And now without further delay, I wanna introduce the Vice Chancellor of Governmental Relations, David O'Brien. He has joined us. Um, he's the newest member of our team and now an expert. This is month number one on the job and I wanna uh, hand it over to Vice Chancellor O'Brien. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, and thank you to all of our participants for being here for this unique one-of-a-kind virtual town hall. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Deputy Chancellor Gonzalez mentioned, I recently joined the Chancellor's Office, and I am so honored to have joined a team that is so interested in elevating the voices and concerns of students and partnering with students. My background is in student advocacy and affordability, uh, having most recently worked at the California Student Aid Commission. So it's a pleasure to be here and a real pleasure to be leading this panel here today. We're very excited to have three current students here today to share their perspective. Uh, that is, after all, why we all do what we do. So these students, um, I want to especially commend the students we have here on our panel today, who I'm going to introduce and speak with, because not only are they current students dealing with the COVID-19 crisis and how it has affected their education and their life uh, experience, but they're still serving as student leaders while they do so, inspiring and serving as an example and a role model to other students. And that is an exceptional level of public service. So I especially wanna commend these and all of our student leaders statewide who are really doing double duty, not only dealing with this crisis and the impact it's had to their education and lives, but continuing to lead um, both campus and statewide student organizations as our students here today do. Please understand as we go through these questions with these students that uh, their intention and our intention as we share these student experiences and recommendations for what colleges can do to assist students during this crisis and what the state can do, this is done so purely in the spirit of inspiring policymakers and campus leaders and, and sharing best practices. And so with that in mind, we have um, our student leaders here and uh, on this slide, photographs of them as well. I will introduce them. Uh, we have Alexis Zaragoza, who, as Dr. Gonzalez mentioned earlier, is a student member of the Community College's Board of Governors. Alexis is also a student um, both at Modesto Junior College and at UC Berkeley. So thank you, Alexis, for being here. We have Danny Tiracool, who is a student at Sacramento City College. He's local here. Um, as well as at Sacramento State University. And Danny is the statewide president of the Student Senate for California Community Colleges. And we are honored to have Samantha Gonzalez Polito. Samantha is the Student Government Association president at Bakersfield College. So thank you all so much for being here. And uh, we have a series of questions we'd love to get your input on. And Samantha, uh, I will start with you. Tell us a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted your educational experience. So when I think about how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted my education experience, I think about how it impacted my sisters, my friends, my fellow renegades education. The transition has been difficult for all of us, students who don't have access to computers or internet, individuals who have never taken or taught online. Um, it's impacting our everyday work. There were many barriers that were brought up, such as how would STEM classes conduct lab experiments or performing art, arts classes fulfill their learning outcomes. 
Since March 2nd, under the direction of our college president, Dr. Sonia Christian, we immediately went into action on solutions to multiple problems being brought up. And for that, I can say I'm very thankful. I attended the various workshops and training sessions, which aided faculty to learn how to continue and engage their, their classes in an online environment. One example is my friend Brandon. He's a nursing major who was at the beginning worried about completing his clinical hours. When Brandon and I talked recently, he, he shared that he and his classmates stepped up and served our Bakersfield, Bakersfield community as there is a need for healthcare workers. I'm a proud renegade to say that 69 Bakersfield College student nurses joined the fight against COVID-19 in our community. Um, these are my peers working in the workforce on the front line. And I think that is so powerful to share. BC students came to rescue in our community. So I can say that the COVID-19 pandemic definitely impacted our educational experience, but our administration, staff, faculty, and our Renegade students have dedicated their time and efforts into making this transition the best one we can have. Our learning and education are number one to us, and the COVID-19 pandemic won't stop us from achieving our main goal, which is a college degree. Great, thank you so much, Samantha. And thank you um, for the very real human reminder that our community college students are indeed on the front lines of the battle against this pandemic. And that's why it's so important to su continue supporting them. Danny, how about you? How has COVID impacted your educational experience? Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, you know, I, I wanna first say that, um, you know, the Student Center for California Community College, we are doing a survey of our students to get a good feel about, you know, what is happening and what's impacting our community college students. And, you know, looking at some of the responses, um, they hold so true for myself at the, in the same ways, you know. Um, and the, one of the biggest concerns, you know, that there is, um, is just this transition to online learning. It is just extremely difficult. And for me, myself, I've definitely um, not gotten enough sleep, you know. Um, you might say that's just college life, you know, you don't get a lot of sleep, but this is a, a lot less sleep than usual. Um, you know, some of the preliminary results from our surveys indicate that over 66% of students are having extreme high levels of stress, anxiety, uh, or even depression. And it makes sense, you know, uh, another statistic that came out with our survey, um, 40 to 50% of our students are having difficulties transitioning to online education. And that same 40 to 50 students are also um, experiencing loss of income, resulting in a lot of, you know, pressure to succeed. You know, our system serves so many disproportionately impacted students, um, low income and, and minorities that, you know, um, this situation has really um, stopped us from achieving our educational goals. Um, not even our educational goals either, our career goals for that matter. Um, you know, one in five students based on our survey had to drop at least one class or more in order to try to make it through. And it's just not okay. Um, I, I use example a lot and I think it holds true for so many reasons. You know, you sign up for a cooking class and it's like they just gave you a cookbook and told you to go home and learn it. That's not how it's supposed to be. You know, you don't know if that student has the right cooking materials. You don't know if that person has the right ingredients. You don't even know if they have the right environment at home in order to even to do what they need to do. Um, and so, you know, I'm having the same issues with myself, you know, especially because I have uh, a younger niece. She's four years old and her daycare is out. So half the time I have to babysit, which cuts into my study time. And if I'm trying to teach myself these materials um, via online, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if any of you have kids, but you can imagine it is fairly difficult to get your work done with um, kids running around in your household. And I think, and I just feel for all of those students out there who have families or have people that they need to take care of and can't do the work that they need to do. Thank you, Danny. And a really, really important reminder that our community college students have seen this crisis have a serious impact on not just their education, but their lives. Uh, so many of them being caregivers or parents, uh, struggling with the loss of income from losing jobs. So really, really important reminder for everyone here. 
Uh, and then Alexis, how has COVID impacted your educational experience? Um, yes, uh, so I'd say COVID has really impacted my educational experience in so many ways, it's hard to recount. Um, I think, I mean, even just looking at it emotionally and, you know, physically, I've had to move away from, you know, like you said before, I am also a student at UC Berkeley because um, I just transferred this year, but I'm also still taking classes at MJC. And, you know, it's just, I had to move back home. I, um, you know, have not had the right technology um, really all semester to be able to do things online that was kind of just floating by. But then, of course, with the sudden integration of having to do a lot of stuff online has made it extremely difficult. Um, and that's on top of just, you know, all of my friends have moved away and I didn't even get to say goodbye and, you know, things like that, that have really impacted me and all kinds of other students in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, it's affected things like research, things like, you know, I mean, I did that kind of stuff when I was still in community college, right? Working with different faculty members and just having those connections and, I think all of that was just kind of taken away very abruptly. Um, but, you know, it's really impacted me also because I was never good at online classes. <laughs> um, and what's interesting is that, you know, because of my unique situation, I was taking two online classes at uh, MJC and uh, they were going well, of course, during the semester I was making do, you know, since it wasn't that many classes that were online. But then when everything happened, it, there was kind of this assumption of, oh, well, this class is already online. And so we don't need to make any kind of accommodations for you and kind of had to stop them and, you know, have a meeting with them and say, hey, my entire life just got turned upside down and my hours just got cut and everything's transitioning to online. And I, like I need time <laughs> to figure this stuff out. And even now I barely have gotten moved back in. I have barely gotten settled and it's been what, like a month or so out from the crisis. And so, um, you know, things have been happening nonstop and I feel like I've barely been able to take a breath and it's already almost finals week, like next week. So, um, you know, things have just been really crazy and, you know, that has had a deep, um, you know, not just educational impact, but I mean, you know, emotionally, physically, it's been very exhausting uh, for us as students. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Alexis. And, and again, the, the time it took so many students to get, you know, to try to get adjusted to this is, is really time that's been lost forever. Um, but that is a, an important transition or, or, or leads us to a segue to my next question is, what supports has your college implemented um, or what would you recommend or like to see implemented or funded at your college? Um, and, and I'm sure we could speak about this one for hours, but just sort of top of mind that you'd like to see to help students uh, such as yourself succeed in a remote and online environment. And Samantha, we'll start with you. Okay, so during any crisis, miscommunication and wrong information can lead to anxiety and chaos, as Danny said previously. It is important during this time um, for that we have good, reliable, and consistent communication. Um, BC and especially President Christian has been communicating with us, the students, staff, faculty, and community members since January 2020 um, about what is going on in our world and our community in regards to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and how the college plans to ensure community safety. Um, each week, President Christian and other BC staff and faculty work hard to communicate to the Renegade community through virtual seminars. Um, these seminars give us research updates about the COVID-19 pandemic and new discoveries. Um, we then hear from three to four panelists, which include faculty um, from various disciples, students from varying majors, um, staff from departments, and even local and state leaders all sharing how they're working through the pandemic and giving us hope. Even virtually, we are coming together twice a week to give support. Apart from the virtual seminar, um, Bakersfield College has other resources. The Student Health and Wellness Center provides virtual health appointments, telemental health services, um, COVID-19 forums, and they still give our flu shots to students who need them. It is so important our health, including mind, body, and spirit are at its strongest right now. 
Um, we have our Office of Student Life drive through pantry that provides students with daily food, clothing, hygiene, and some essentials. Um, Maricel, a strong renegade leader and soon to be the first person in her family with a higher education degree, shared with me the struggle she is facing when her parents lost their jobs due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And now they rely on our pantry services to access food for their family. Recently, Bakersfield College established a Chromebook, Chromebook loaner program for our students to ensure they would have a good reliable electronic device to help them succeed in their online courses. This was only established by a generous, donate, um, generous donation by a BC alumni um, whose hearts opened up um, the possibility for renegades to complete their academics. I just received an email yesterday from Tia, who is a mother of five, um, telling me that she is finishing her certificate in childhood development and how, um, how she is now going to get her um, AA just because she sees the possibility um, to receive it. She was thinking of letting it all go. And who knew a sim simple item as a Chromebook would have that big of an effect um, for a student's outcome. Um, there are so many more resources and our administration, faculty, and staff have done it for us, um, the students, because they care about our renegade family and our learning. Um, some of the core values of Bakersfield College are learning, community, and wellness. Bakersfield College has worked endlessly to ensure their students are able to learn, have a renegade community, and ensure there's a positive impact on every individual Renegade's health. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted us immensely, um, but we are turning it into a positive outcome through resources that I'm so thankful for as a student. Great, thank you so much. Danny, how about you? What supports um, has your college implemented or would you recommend being implemented to help you succeed? You know, I, I wanna first um, thank all community colleges really at this time, you know, they, I think we have done great as a system in reacting and making sure that we address, um, you know, our con the concerns um, little by little, uh, making sure that everything is being touched on, <clears throat> making sure that, you know, services are being provided um, and things like that. And I think that at this point, really what's important is this um, moving forward, uh, moving into the fall semester, making sure that we have those adequate, adequate resources to truly deliver a great online education and you know someone told this to me before there is a difference between the distance education that we've been doing versus a true online education and i think when we start talking about those differences we'll be able to really clarify exactly how we're going to serve um, our students making sure that they have the best education right a lot of our students are first time in their family to go to college many are first time uh, first generation american you know and I've said this before, if you're first time generation American, and first time in your family to go to college, you have a duty to succeed. And you know, with this COVID-19 crisis, it really puts a heavier barrier on, on those families and those individuals, right? They were expecting to get, a lot of students were expecting to get their certificate or AA this summer or this, uh, this, this semester, right? They can't do that. They can't walk across that stage, that very huge benchmark in a lot of people's lives. Um, and they have to now um, either wait until next semester, next year, um, or some of them because of the recession may just have to drop out and, and go, into, um, go into the workforce, or at least try to go into the workforce if they can. Um, if they can. And I think uh, moving forward, we just have to understand those issues, make sure that we have those resources and encourage students to continue to stay in, um, to, to come back if they're gonna go and join the workforce, you know, get your education done. We have to make sure we have those resources ready and we make sure that we have a plan a plan to um, have those online education, have a plan to switch to in-person if we need to, and vice versa. Thank you, Danny. Alexis, what about you? And I know we, we talked a little bit about this previously, but, but you're sort of in a unique situation um, being both a community college student and a UC student at the same time, which sounds daunting enough in and of itself. Um, uh, not, not to mention being a member of our Board of Governors and advocating for your fellow students uh, so well as, as you have done. But um, in particular, anything that you have seen 
your UC campus do that community colleges, understanding that we're not as well resourced, could look for funding to do or, or any pra best practices we could try to replicate within the community college system if we have the resources? Um, yeah, absolutely. And yes, you're absolutely right in that where we just, you know, we don't have enough funding within the community colleges to be able to properly help our students. And so all the help that I've gotten for the most part has been from Berkeley because of that. And of course, you know, we understand that Berkeley is this really expensive school. We pay a lot into it and we get these kind of resources back. But, um, you know, the thing is I have seen, you know, just from the emails and everything in my Modesto inbox and everything else, um, you know, our community colleges are trying. They're trying really hard. And, you know, I know for a while we, we um, Modesto was doing a lot of, you know, textbook loaner programs. They were doing, we have a huge emergency fund. Um, there's just so many things that MJC has done that's really great for our students. I know they tried to keep the library open for as long as possible. Um, but sadly, you know, things like the library isn't open anymore. And there are students out here who, you know, are not getting consistent meals. They're not um, in a safe place to study. They don't have access to laptops. And, you know, even the ones that we had um, at the school, I worked in the library before this. Um, and, you know, even those, just the laptops in general, were not up to date. They're not great for, you know, phone calls like this or anything like that. Um, and so the thing is, we just don't have enough funding, you know, versus me being able to get a MacBook from Berkeley and rent it out for the semester. And, you know, they've been able to offer me hotspot um, coming to my house, which I haven't installed yet. But, um, you know, sometimes my internet does get really spotty because, you know, me and my entire family are working from home right now. And so, you know, things like that have been really helpful that they've been able to give me. They've been able to maintain their food pantries. The libraries um, are not all open, but one of them is open um, for students to still be able to come in. They didn't kick us out of our housing, um, you know, things like that. And so, you know, I've been able to see a lot of stuff that has come from Berkeley that I know that our community colleges would do if they can't, if they could, and if they had the resources to. Um, you know, a lot of our students are losing jobs right now. Um, for me, in three weeks, I'm not going to have my consistent work study job anymore because school is going to be ending. That's finals week. And so, you know, a lot of students are dealing with that right now. We just, we need that emergency funding. We need those scholarships going to our students. We need to give out laptops and, you know, even looking toward things like, you know, summer and, um, you know, it's not happening for some colleges or all colleges. It just, you know, but there's students out here who, who need that and who are still struggling. And right now, I mean, they're going to be taking their finals online and can do they even have access? Um, and it's just, it's been a huge problem for all of our students. So I, you know, I obviously do wish that our community colleges could, you know, do more in that area, but that's all dependent on funding and whether we're gonna get it or not. And I know that we are trying our hardest on this end, so. Thank you, Alexis. Well, we're trying our hardest um, in large part because of the amazing efforts from student leaders such as yourself and our system and campus partners who joined this town hall here today. So thank you for that really potent reminder of why we're here today, literally on this town hall right here and now. Um, I see that we're getting a little close on our time here. So I'm going to combine my last two questions into one question um, and, and ask everybody to just think about one thing. So one thing that you each recommend state legislators and policymakers prioritize in terms of California community colleges that would make a difference. And then one piece of advice from you personally to your fellow students who may be thinking about uh, giving up on their education, dropping out right now, who are just despondent. So one thing for each. Um, Samantha, let's start with you. Okay. Um, firstly, I want to thank all statewide legislators listening in to our perspectives as California Community College students. Um, personally, um, and I've seen it from, from our campus, from my perspective, I would like to see investments in non-tuition basic costs for all students. An investment um, that I find important to make a difference in all the lives of California Community College students. These include resources for laptop loaner programs, food pantry services, transportation, undocumented student program assistance, and more. Because I personally have seen that the laptop loaner program, um, we, can only, we only had it because BC alumni donated their um, donors donated 
their generous donation to us just to enable us to have that. And it has helped so many students. Um, but this is a true cost of attendance, yet it is adequately back, it is it isn't adequately factored into our aid. Um, and for the students that are listening, all I have to say is that um, to when you're thinking about giving up on your education, think about the reason why you choose to go to college and why you continue to go to college. Um, I understand that it is very hard right now, but it is only a bump in the road and we are all in this together. Um, you are not alone. We are not alone. Um, so at Bakersfield College, we have this saying, we are BC. I'm wearing my BC shirt right now. <laughs> and um, when we say this, we mean that we are here as a family to get through any obstacle together. And BC and I are extending our arms to you right now, our CCC brothers, sisters, and everyone to let you know that we are here for you and we will get through this together as a California Community College family. And if you think that um, stopping your education for the time being is the right choice for you and your health, then please do so. Remember that your health is number one and your mindset is imp very important during this time. But as you choose to leave, remember to come back to your education. Come back to finish your goals that you set out for yourself and don't give up. We believe in you. We are BC. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. Um, and I love the we are BC. We may have to appropriate it and make it we are CCC. I'm looking at Dr. Gonzalez now. Uh, Danny, how about you? So the two part question, one thing you think legislators should prioritize to make a difference for community college students and one piece of advice from you personally about students thinking about um, giving up their education right now. Yeah, well, again, thank you very much for having me on here and thank you for all the legislators that are on the line and all, and all the state leaders and all the uh, attendees here. Um, I think my choice would be Cal Grant reform, hands down. Um, I think if we're looking at how we're going to not only help our neediest students and our low-income students, um, but as we look at how we're going to also combat these economic the economic recession and these, these barriers put on students, we already know that they need additional financial assistance already. This Cal Grant reform will provide that as well as expand eligibility for those low-income students so that more students are served and more students can receive that kind of assistance. Um, and I think it would be great um, if we had that so that way those students who do leave and decide to come back, they do have those resources and assistance to continue their education. So I think Cal Grant reform, hands down, is something that we're going to need. Um, in terms of my advice to all the students, I think Samantha said it great, don't give up, you know. Um, you know us three here on this panel, uh, we're, we're fighting for all of you out there. Well, we wanna make sure that your voice is heard, your concerns are made, and that we're working with you know, the chancellor's office and state leaders and the legislature to make sure that uh, we address those concerns so that you all can succeed. So don't give up. We're not giving up. We're not giving up on you. We're gonna continue to fight. So we hope that you will continue um, and don't give up and fight with us. Great, thank you for the, the, the words of inspiration, Danny, and, and we hope that they are meaningful and helpful to your fellow student leaders. Uh, Alexis, we'll wrap up with you. So the, the one thing you think legislators uh, and policymakers should prioritize, as well as some personal advice from you to your fellow students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I have so many conversations with students and, um, you know, my friends and people who are still in the community college system and they're always afraid of transferring because they're like, oh my gosh, it's so expensive. And I tell them every single time I'm better off now um, being at the UC because they have the, you know, the funding to be able to give me, you know, a, a full ride and everything else. Um, whereas, you know, when I was in community college, I was struggling. It was, it was really tough. Um, and I know that all of my friends who are questioning right now whether or not they even want to transfer because of the prospects of what's going on, um, you know, I have to tell them every single time, you're going to get money when you come here, most likely at least, right? And so for me, it would be Cal Grant reform because I know that the numbers that Danny was pointing out earlier with the students that are struggling right now with the students who are not sure if they can stay in and everything else, those numbers would be so much lower if we just had Cal Grant reform years ago if we weren't pushing it off every single year, um, 
you know, if we weren't just being tossed uh, the scraps, as I like to say, you know, and as if we weren't being told to, you know, be grateful for those, um, you know, don't question it. And, you know, I think that, you know, right now it's really hard. It's, it's really tough because of this whole situation, but, you know, we've put it off for years. We have co consistently been told that, you know, we need it, but not yet or we need it, but we can hang in there a little bit longer, or, you know, just being given slight increases every once in a while. But, you know, our students need so much more. And I know that if they were getting closer to $6,000 uh, a year instead of the smaller amount that we get, which is, you know, closer to around 2,000, um, less than that, then I wouldn't be getting so many students coming to me asking, where can I get emergency grants? Where can I get loans? How do I do all of this? Um, we wouldn't see that as much and we can't continue to pretend that homeless students and students that are home insecure are this super small minority. They're, they're not. I mean, sure, they may not be the vast majority, but it's such a significant number that you have to question what we're doing wrong and that's it, is that we're not getting enough money that's going directly to students. Um, and so Cal Grant reform would be absolutely number one and I know it's going to be rough, but the thing is, I think that the outcome of us helping students right now, students who are not able to, for the most part, get a stimulus check or any of these different things that are helping out, um, I think that's going to be worth it in the end because, you know, um, just like the assembly member said previously is, you know, we're the backbone of the California economy. And how can we expect our students to continue to pursue higher education when, you know, even during this kind of a crisis, we can't help them properly. Um, and so there's that. And I would also just say to students is that, you know, the finish line is so worth it, um, no matter whether they're getting a certificate or just trying to do, you know, get better wherever they're working or just get that associate's degree or whether it's going to be transferring and going to grad school or whatever it is. Um, it's at the end is so worth it because, I mean, you know, now I'm on this kind of other side and it's been really great and I've had access to so much opportunity here and, you know, if, if I had given up at any point, then I wouldn't be here right now. And so even though it's hard right now, just pushing through and even if you do need to take a break, come right back. Um, you know, just keep pursuing it because it's worth it. Thank you so much um, and, and thank you for closing on uh, what we hope is a really hopeful and positive note to the extent that we can stay hopeful and positive during such a trying and uncertain time we want to and we know that our students, um, those that are watching, and those that are going to watch this webinar later, and those that are going to participate in other events and, and see the, the social media um, are inspired by all three of you and your perseverance and your leadership. So thank you so much for being here and for amplifying these concerns. Been, um, been occasionally monitoring the chat during this panel and it has just been nothing but um, an out, outpouring of positivity from system leaders, from your fellow students. So glad to see you here today. Um, and they're also glad to see students statewide as well as your campuses represented. So thank you so much for everything. Um, the, the one question that we wanted to address and we addressed it in the chat box was a link to the Student Senate survey. So thank you to Julie Adams, the Interim Executive Director for providing that and for the Student Senate for that helpful and informative survey. Um, are there um, any final closing real quick remarks before we turn it back over to Deputy Chancellor Gonzalez? Okay. Well, thank you all so much. And it's been an honor to moderate this panel here today. And we look forward to continuing to work with uh, and for and advocate for you. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, Alexis, Samantha. Uh, thank you for all of your words. And we only exist because of you. Um, and I hope that you see that from our office, certainly from our team, the Board of Governors, um, and all of your campus leaders. Uh, I wanna make sure that you are one, sharing your information. I saw a lot of love uh, requesting your contact information. So feel free to share that if you feel comfortable. Danny, lots of requests around the survey and if you could share that. So we will leave that up to you to respond. There are some folks who are doing some research for their own graduate education. So even then, anything we can do to pay it forward. For those of you who are waiting for answers to your questions, we are not ignoring you. Um, we will have a Q&A portion to this town hall. We are tracking some of those things. 
Uh, but we are almost there, everyone. I want to hand it over to our Vice Chancellor, Lizette Navarrete, who's going to cover all of these incredible uh, supporters that we have, but really introduce four key partners who are here with us today. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor Gonzalez. Um, I, I want to show, um, you know, so, uh, beyond seeing the inspiring stories of our students uh, and, and your leadership and, uh, and what you're doing to support other fellow students. Uh, another slide that we have today that really inspires me is this one. It's the one that shows um, all of our partners that have come together uh, recognizing that um, the road ahead is going to be tough, but uh, we will get through this together uh, and we are stronger together. So uh, I just wanna again, thank all of our partners. Um, we will be working in the coming months to tell the community college story um, and ensure that we can support uh, not only the response, but the recovery and be there for our Californians. So I next uh, want to and turn it over and invite um, some of our partners. Um, we, we don't have uh, the opportunity to hear from everyone, but we do um, have four of our partners that have joined us on the letter to say a couple of things about our, our key priorities. So I'll first invite Dr. Cynthia Olivo, who's the president of the Chief uh, the Student Services Association, uh, and um, to say a few words. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank, thank you, Vice Chancellor Navarrete. And like our, our Deputy Chancellor, Dr. Daisy Gonzalez mentioned, uh, the California Community College System also changed the trajectory of not only my life, but the lives of my family members in offering an avenue for social justice and economic prosperity. And, you know, our system's powerful. It's life changing. It transforms so many challenges into opportunities. And so I know that this pandemic unprecedented crisis in our lives is is not going to become an obstacle that we cannot overcome right we'll work together to ensure that we do uh, but it's also really important to reflect upon the fact that you know you heard it from our students they already exhibit a tremendous amount of resiliency in achieving their educational and career goals and we you know the educational leaders we work really relentlessly focused on equity to ensure the best outcomes for our students. And uh, this pandemic, I think, has made the systemic and institutionalized inequities that exist in our society more pronounced. Um, when this disruption occurred, we saw the issues that surfaced. There is still a <clears throat> technological digital divide. Our students need access to reliable Wi-Fi equipment, software, and, you know, as a vice president of student services, I continuously search every week for resources to respond in a quick manner to the students who finally have worked through some of the initial issues that have surfaced in their lives and who move beyond sometimes the shame they feel in having to ask for help. And so, um, you know, even this week, I have three students who need hotspots after we've gone through, um, you know, distributing hundreds of devices, there are students who are still coming forward saying, I need this. And it's really challenging to get it in a quick manner when I know weeks of instruction have already passed and I don't want them to be left behind. So we definitely need to ensure that we have the emergency block grant funding so that we can respond to our students. I also know, uh, many students who belong to families where everybody in the family has lost their job and facing that you know instability that unemployment brings um, for daily living as well as future planning is extremely stressful and so our ability to respond holistically to the needs of our students is extremely important i also think it's it's uh you know critical for us to consider the nuances that exist within our undocumented student population our daca students for example are anxiously awaiting a supreme court decision and as we provide uh, resources our students are contending with an issue called public charge public charge is where they have to figure out whether or not they should um, take advantage of opportunities that we're putting forward because they cannot um, jeopardize their ability to pursue residency in the future. 
So just making sure we have the resources in place, staffing who understand these issues and who can help our students navigate um, these extremely challenging conditions. We need funding to help our students in that regard, especially since they were left out of our Federal CARES Act funding. Um, we have to then look in, in, into our own system to see how we can continue helping our students. And I just think um, overall it's important for us to continue doing all of the work that is proving to be helpful um, to making sure that our students stay on track. You know, we have the most promising students um, together if we continue to demonstrate compassion, care, um, we can all be resilient and move through these challenges in a unified manner. Um, finally, I would just ask, you know, our base funding needs to be improved for our, our system. Um, we provide education, holistic support, and responding in emergency situations. Uh, our, our per student uh, funding needs to be improved. And um, this is the advocacy that I put forward today on behalf of the Chief Student Services Officers Association and all of the educators and students in our system. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Appreciate your remarks and your partnership. I next want to turn it over to Katie Hardman, who is a legislative advocate and key partner with us from the California Teachers Association. Thank you for your support and for being here. Katie. Great, thank you. And thanks for including CTA um, in this conversation today. I'm just gonna talk briefly kind of high level about the overall Proposition 98 level for our schools and community colleges. As we all know, we're likely entering into a pretty severe recession, which will have a significant impact on state revenues as well as the Proposition 98 funding level. Um, fortunately, you know, we have Prop 98 that does protect education probably more than other areas of the budget. Um, but as we've seen in prior recessions, um, Prop 98 can be even more susceptible to underfunding during you know, these difficult times um, you know, due to either suspension of the guarantee or manipulation, kind of those funding shifts. Um, and so I think you know, protecting the integrity of Prop 98 is um, you know, always a high priority for CTA and all of our you know, community college partners, but I think it's especially important this year um, and during this economic downturn. Um, so we all know that you know, the, there are difficult decisions that have to be made during, around the budget um, this year, um, and our hope is really that we can all work together to prioritize those limited Prop 98 dollars um, in order to maintain as much stability with our community college system as we can for our students and, and staff. So that's all, thanks. Thank you, Katie. Appreciate um, your, your efforts again, um, and we look forward to partnering in the coming months. I now want to invite um, an, another of our partners, Manny Rodriguez from the Education Trust West to share a little bit more about other key priorities in our, in our shared letter. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Manny Rodriguez. I'm a senior legislative associate for the Education Trust West. We're a research and advocacy organization working to expose and eradicate uh, the injustices, inequalities, and equities uh, in our schools and colleges. First, I'd like to thank the Chancellor's Office for the ability to join you all and for the amazing panelists today, um, especially the students, and, and for you all sharing your experiences and stories. That was awesome. Um, from ETW's perspective, one of the most important things the governor and the legislature can do to help students from low-income communities, students of color, succeed in the face of this crisis is to protect education funding from early learning through higher education. If cuts are necessary, avoid making them across the board. Um, and students who are the most in need should be prioritized for funding um, and should be cut the least. I'll emphasize uh, that this is particularly true for our community college system, as, as we've heard today. Trends have shown us that when the economy or job market dips, uh, folks really turn to the community college system uh, to receive professional development, training, and improve their career prospects. So the community college system will play a critical role in California's economic uh, and employment recovery for the millions of Californians that have been displaced by COVID-19. 
Um, as an education equity organization looking at the P16 system, I'd like to share some of the recommendations we recently put out on protecting education funding uh, from our COVID-19 edition of our Equity 8 list. Uh, those four recommendations are providing financial resources to early care education programs to prevent closures as a result of losing tuition, preserve funding uh, for Prop 98, local control funding formula, system, statewide system of support, uh, our higher ed segments, and particularly the student center funding formula at the community college system. Prioritize funding for student services at colleges and universities in order to serve the hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis and avoid cutting categorical funds focused on closing attainment gaps. And last, maintain and improve upon California's reputation of having one of the most progressive and generous financial aid system to help our lowest income students move into a post-secondary education. Thanks and look forward to working uh, together with you all. Thank you, Manny. Appreciate your partnership um, and your efforts in higher education. Um, I now want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Joe Wise. Dr. Joe Wise is the president of Shasta College and the president of the uh, uh, CEOs for the California Community Colleges. Thank you, um, and I turn it over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be a part of this today, and um, I'd also remark on how uh, wonderful it was to listen to the students and the challenges and the hope that they provided. Um, from Shasta College perspective, from the CEO perspective, I um, just want to remind everyone how resilient we are as a system. Um, I think of here at Shasta College, the first uh, 10, 11 years I worked here, we've never, never had a closed campus once. And in the last 18, 20 months, we've had uh, two fires, uh, three or four public safety shutoffs, a snowstorm that shut us for a couple of days. Um, we had to evacuate commencement because of a tornado warning and uh, lightning. And, um, and now this, so, um, but we're getting through it together. Uh, we're very strong as a system. Um, I would urge that we uh, continue to protect our uh, community's opportunities um, for rebuilding and for the future um, by doing everything possible to protect the community college, uh, our, our ability to provide training and retraining opportunities for our folks that they're gonna need over the coming months. Um, I really, uh, support the entire letter, uh, but wanted to emphasize a couple of points um, uh, relating to the online uh, education infrastructure request. Um, I think that's uh, very important for us as we have all the uncertainty of potential future surges in this uh, virus and um, for planning for the next year. I also want to emphasize the idea of the uh, keeping the bond projects going, uh, those keep jobs going in our communities, our local communities throughout the state and uh, continues to provide us hope and opportunity for long-term planning uh, to meet the needs uh, through the recovery and beyond. And then lastly, I just wanna emphasize uh, the idea of uh, being able to plan well for this. Uh, part of the frustration uh, we find sometimes is uh, just the uncertainty upon uncertainty that comes in these times. So. The example I'm thinking of is the um, potential deficit factors that come very late or at the end of the year that we never really know um, how big those will be or how small um, because of property tax shortfalls or enrollment fees shortfalls. So even a one year reprieve um, from having that happen and having certainty that that won't happen would be a huge help in our planning and be able to respond uh, to whatever budget decisions are made in the coming months. So that, that's what I'd like to share and uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all of you. And again, thank you to all of our partners that have joined on. We look forward to the hard work ahead to convince legislators of the value and importance that our community colleges bring and the opportunity and hope that they bring for our students and Californians. I'll turn it back over to Deputy Chancellor Daisy Gonzalez. All right, folks, I want to acknowledge that we are already past our time, so I will make this very quick. I want to make sure that we capture four key questions that were asked during this webinar. One, can we use other sources of funding for undocumented students who have been excluded from the CARES Act? Can, specifically, the question was, can we use SEA funds? The answer is yes. Um, we were clear at the beginning of this webinar that today's focus and goal was to amplify the voices of California's community colleges 
and to remind our state leaders that California community colleges are ready to help California recover. I want to make that clear that for those of you who have been joining us for our Wednesday webinars, we will continue to have those webinars. In fact, you can join us next week. Two requests that came in through the Q&A box was, can you have a webinar on veteran student benefits and currently incarcerated students and how they're being served? We are tracking that, um, but it, the appropriate space is at a future Wednesday webinar. Lastly, a lot of questions around where this PowerPoint and this video will be recorded. Once again, that is in our Vision Resource Center. If you have challenges accessing that, I wanna remind you that the Vision Resource Center is only a site for professional development for those in our system. So if you wanna access this PowerPoint or this video, you're gonna to need to uh, email info at cccco.edu if you're not from our system. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can ask us any other sort of follow-up question through that email as well. So please join us for our Wednesday webinars. Uh, any final thoughts, Chancellor Oakley? I can hear. There we go. We can hear. Um, yes. Uh, I just want to say thank you. I mean, we've had um, a couple of thousand participants today. It just speaks to how much everyone cares about our future and about our students. So we don't know what the future is going to look like. What we do know is that it will look very different than what we were used to before COVID-19. So we all need to be uh, ready to be able to adapt and support uh, our students, whatever comes our way. And it'll be up to us to meet them where they're at. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Please continue to use the Guided Pathways framework to raise questions, talk about how we continue to adapt and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Chancellor Oakley, and thank you to all of our panelists. I wanna remind you that our day is not over. Our advocacy day will continue. Our primary hashtag is uh, support CCC education. Another hashtag you can use is true cost of college. Our board will now enter into a training session for our advocacy day, and they will be meeting with legislators until 3.30. So please follow us on Twitter and thank you so much for joining us. There were 2,101 participants at one point in time. I also want to share that we will be saving every story from this chat box. Don't be surprised if we follow up because there were a lot of powerful stories. I want to thank you for sharing those and thank you for making our virtual town hall a success. Have a great day, everyone.